the just give me one second yeah meeting is now streaming live please i have to do certain arrangements here Okay, we are ready. Shall I start, sir? Sure. Madam said she'll join. So shall I start, sir? Yeah, please. Uh, so good evening, everyone. So today I'll be presenting a case, a 27 year old man uh, from Vellur, uh, belongs to upper middle class according to modified Kupusami classification. Presented to us with the chief complaints of yellowish discoloration of urine and eyes since uh, last two weeks, abdominal pain since two weeks, generalized itching and pale colored stool, stool since one week. The total duration is only two weeks. Sir? The current duration of the current illness is only for yes, two sir. weeks. Two weeks, yes, sir. For two weeks only. Okay, fine. Yeah. Proceed. So these are the chief presenting complaints. Kindly elaborate on these things. Okay, Jaundice two weeks, abdominal pain two weeks, uh, generalized change. Generalized change. Okay. So, patient was apparently uh, normal before two weeks when he noticed yellowish discoloration of urine. Okay. Will you be closer to your uh, computer? You are less audible. So, patient was apparently normal before two weeks uh, when he noticed yellowish discoloration of urine and he was told by his colleagues about yellowish discoloration of eyes. And both were progressively worsened over the next two weeks. Uh, history of upper abdomen pain since two weeks, uh, more on the right side of upper abdomen, which was constant, dull, mild in intensity, non radiating type of pain with sudden, sharp rise in severity of pain after food intake, and uh, which lasts for 20 to 30 minutes, subsided spontaneously, or sometimes he needs medications for the pain. There was history of itching for one week all over the body. And, uh, noted, uh, noted more on the extremities, more during evening time, worsened for last two days. First history of passing pale yellow colored stools for one week uh, with normal consistency stools, uh, one or two times a day, uh, no nocturnal episodes, not mixed with blood or mucus. There was history of loss of appetite since one week, but uh, no history of any significant weight loss. History of easy can you, fatigue. Can you tell me about the abdominal pain? Can you go back to the last one? Yes, sir. Uh, patient complained more uh, uh, pain, particularly on the right side of the upper abdomen, sir, uh, which he felt was constant throughout the, the uh, it was throughout for last two weeks, which was dull and mild intensity. But only after food intake, he felt there was a sudden sharp uh, rise in pain. That to lasted, that to lasted for 20 to 30 minutes. Mm. This uh, sudden severe pain is noted uh, since how many days? The overall uh, duration of pain is only for two weeks. Two, two weeks, weeks, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Dull aching, mild pain in the right upper part, and that means right, right upper part of the abdomen. Yes, sir. The dull aching pain present throughout. Yes, sir. So when did he notice this uh, sharp, severe pain occurring uh, after food intake? Um, after food intake. When, when was it? Was it from the beginning or only recently? Uh, for last, uh, around 7 to 10 days, sir. Initially, three day, I mean, throughout it was for two weeks, but last around 7 to 10 days, it was like increasing severity of pain after a food intake. Okay. In which condition will you get this? Sharp increase, sharp increase, after severe, food. after taking food. When will you get a sharp increase after food? No I think you have to be case. careful when you no mention pain. about pain no. related to food intake. No pain will be a sharp increase after food intake. Okay. And subsides spontaneously after medication. There's too much of a, you know, a stretch on the history which is not meaningful at all. One is a dull pain. And on top of this dull pain, you just tell what, what was your thought process. What is your thought process? No, a yes, since, since the pain was constant and uh, dull aching, uh, 
I was mm. thinking like a parenchymal origin. Yeah, in that situation, then you get a sharp pain, and that to increasing with food intake, and that to the right hypochondrium. You think the patient, patients will take thousands of cases. How long after uh, food he gets, she gets, he gets pain, doctor? So he told after, uh, after or, or 10 to 15 minutes, he felt an uh, increase in pain and it lasted for around 30 minutes. So generally, if it's a uh, after food pain, if it's a dual ulcer, it'll come one to two hours after food, after the emptying. If at all you want to think of some pain which can precipitate it by uh, food, it can only be gallstones. But it will not go with, come, come with such uh, regular intensity. Okay. okay. No. So if it is not really uh, fitting into the thing, kindly don't add on to this history. Then the examination go on, tell me the causes of pain which increase after food. So always tell me now at least what are the causes which, for food pain which can increase after food. This is how the exam goes on. Probably uh, gallstones, pain due to gallstones, and uh, pain uh, due to uh, gastric ulcers. Agishwamar, when you say answer to a question, Tell the most likely possibilities first. That should be the rule. It should be always the rule. Okay. So, okay. gallstone pains are usually episodic pain, which is okay. probably precipitated by putting it. Okay. And last for about six hours and it disappeared. But if a pain which was there for two weeks and if it is produced by putting it, uh, then you should consider the causes which are likely to be the pain, uh, which is likely to be aggravated by putting it on a regular okay. basis. Then I'll put first as gastric ulcers. Okay. Gastro duodenal disease. Okay. You are okay. right. Okay. Anything else? Only that much. We, there, are, um, there are so many causes of abdominal pain which can be aggravated by food intake, no? In, uh, gastric malignancies. Okay, when you say gastro duodenal causes, we understood mostly if you say ulcer, ulcers. For infiltrative disorders, that is understood. Okay. Okay. Next. What happens in chronic pancreatitis? Yes, it's a chronic pancreatitis. It increases after food intake. Gastric ulcer. All these can produce. Okay. What yes, about pardon. small intestinal disease? What does small intestinal do? So you should know the time profile of the pain after food. Dural ulcer you get after one, two hours, one half, two hours after food, then the stomach empties after food. Gastric ulcer is something. Mesenteric ischemia. Yes, it takes nearly 30 minutes to half an hour, one hour later. So whenever you say it is food, you should know this thing. But if it is just about 15 to 20 minutes, then it does not really fit in. Okay, go ahead. The other thing I want to comment here is this. We just go back. Please go back. Yes. See, once don't bring the pain. No, we're describing jaundice. Finish off the itching, finish off the pain stool, and then come to the abdominal pain. You're moving backward and forward. No, we discussed jaundice, then you went back to pain, then you went back to itching, then you go back to pain stool. Okay. You understand? Between okay. the two, between the two, which do you think would have come first? Jaundice would have come first or pain would have come first? Both are pain. two weeks. Yeah, pain. so therefore describe the pain. Okay. And then say almost simultaneously, and you don't have to say the friends noticed, he noticed yellow color, friends noticed eyes are yellow. It's meaningless, you know, you understand? It's meaningless. So start with the abdominal pain, and then tell that you notice jaundice, that's it. Whether he noticed or his friends noticed makes no sense. Okay. And this was associated passage of pain to and pruritus, that's it. That's it. Okay. And this 100% will stop there. Sudden sharp increase. It, to me, it has not, I've not understood what the two pains. Okay, we okay, can continue. Okay. There was history of uh, loss of appetite present since one week, but there was no history of any significant weight loss. There was history of easy fatigability since last one week. Uh, there was no history of fever, no history of cam intake or recent change of medications, no history of nausea, vomiting, myalgia, joint pain, or headache. There was no history of abdominal distension, uh, GI blood loss in the recent past, uh, no history of altered sensorium or altered sleep pattern. There was no history of involuntary movements, uh, behavioral changes or mood disturbances, no history of uh, recurrent oral ulcers, joint pain or any skin lesions, and, uh, no history of easy fatigability, defective vision, bone pain or paresthesias. There was no history of 
tattooing in the past. So the question here, in the exam you present like this, you expect all the symptoms of uh, bruisability, defective vision, bone pain, paresthesias, uh, involved in BMO change in just a two-week history of rotating joints. Very, very... So your, this thing is only two weeks of okay. rotating joints. So some people will accept, some people will say, do you expect this to come in two weeks of polystatic jaundice? Very unlikely. Okay. How old is the patient? 27. 27 years and two weeks history of abdominal pain and jaundice with polystatic symptoms. Unless it's got a long-standing polystasis, say for two, three months, they symptoms, right? Okay. I was not clear what preceded all these symptoms. You have three, only two important. One is abdominal pain, pain and jaundice, and polystatic symptoms. What preceded is most important. No, instead of saying all the no history. Say right? that most important thing here will be ask for a prodromal no symptom. No symptoms, drug induced, alcohol. These are all okay. things. That is okay. Yes. That initially you said okay, particularly one thing, no history of fever or anything. Okay. I told sir, nausea, vomiting, myalgia, joint pain, headache. There was no prodromal symptoms. And there was no history of cam intake, a recent change of medications. Yeah. When nothing is there, doctor, what is coming into your mind? What is this? What is it that you're dealing with? Something that's what are the differences you have it in the mind? In your mind that it's making you ask Somebody has got, has got a pain uh, for two weeks, then uh, clay colored stools. And Holistic. No, no. He has got pain for abdomen, right up now, sharp increase during pain. He was noticed to have jaundice and he is noticed to have clay colored stools. So, what are the differentials you'll have at this point of time for a 27 year old male patient? Can, so, we, can, we, can we intervene? Uh, what seems to be the syndromic possibility? What do you think? Where is the oh. part of the hepatobiliary biliary system is affected? So, cholestatic jaundice, sir, this is. They have to sub uh, uh, classes. Say this is intrahepatic yeah, or extrahepatic. Extra since patient is complaining a uh, uh, sudden onset and uh, history of pain is there, I will give a little weightage to extrahepatic uh, uh, cholestasis. Only little weightage? Only little weightage? Um, because this pain is a present is important symptom, no? Okay. It has been presenting symptom and it has been there continuously for two weeks. So, do you want to uh, disregard the pain? The general rule is that if you have pain along with the cholestatic jaundice, the statistical probability of having an extra hepatic biliary obstruction is very high. Very high. Okay. There is pain, fever of two weeks duration, right upper quadrant pain. This thing, the most common thing will be an extra. Okay. There is no fever, but you should have added chills or anything to that fever to make sure that there was no cholangitis. So, okay. this hepatic obstruction, what is the diagnosis you have? So, it could be uh, cholidocolithiasis, one possibility. Probably the most common diagnosis will be a cholidocolithiasis. Uh, second thing is a, a benign biliary strictures. Benign biliary stricture uh, in this patient has had no surgery in the past. No? Has he had surgery in the past? No, sir. No, no sir. Apart from it, uh, apart from, uh, so here is a two-week history of abdominal pain followed by jaundice with polystatic symptom, most commonly cholidopolithiasis. And then benign biliary stricture often did not come. If you have a biliary stricture, isolated biliary stricture in any patient, uh, I think the first thing we'll always think of malignancy, but this patient is only 27. If you want to look at benign biliary stricture, you should have most common thing. What is the common cause of biliary stricture? Benign. Post-surgical? No, it's post-surgical. Post-cystectomy yes. post strictures. Okay? Okay. So, benign stricture is the pain is not a common picture, no? Cross of anger? Yeah. For benign stricture. If there is a pain, if there's a pain and you have to consider stricture, I think you have to consider malignant stricture. Malignant. Because that should be of shorter duration and with pain. Pain. Okay. Benign stricture, unless it is complicated with some cholangitis or other things, pain will Most be unusual. Benign biliary stricture 
come with some sort of recurrent cholangitis, veni and biliary stricture. Malignant biliary strictures don't come with cholangitis unless you instrument them. But if there is a pain here and then followed by a stricture, so benign means I think it's a polydopovithiasis. For benign biliary stricture, there is no there is no surgery. But what are the other benign biliary strictures can come like this? IgG4 colon. Okay. Yeah, then? No. Primary sclerosing cholangitis. Two week history. Two weeks. And okay. pain. It's a chronic pain. long, long drawn process, not PSC. Yes, sir. Does I, it I, happen I, acutely? I, I was just wondering whether the pain he's describing was like chronic pancreatitis, you know, and then he has this pain. The other ability, tell what are the other possibilities here? Benign ability structure. Benign structures of you the, said IgG4. Polydopolydia, you said stricture, stricture, you said IgG4. Then? HIV cholangiopathy. No, HIV cholangiopathy patient will be complete, not be all right completely and suddenly land up with stricture. You would have symptoms of HIV. Most of the other common thing which can come is chronic pancreatitis. Oh, yes. Secondary to inflammation. We are just discussing differential diagnosis of benign biliary structure. Okay. So can tuberculosis produce stricture? Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis? Uh, itself it is rare, are... but it is in our country still, like, you, have, you may have to consider it. Okay. Sir. Okay. And which part of the biliary system in HIV you find the maximum chance of a stricture in HIV disease? How many percentage? Six. six. So which part of the biliary system is oh. you get the narrowing? Uh, high, put high, from middle lower ampulla. Hylar. Hylar. No. It's an ampulla. Ampulla. It is mostly an ampullary stenosis. Yeah. Ampullary stenosis. Ampullary And uh, if this patient had a history of a uh, bleed earlier in childhood, then you think of a Focal cavernoma phalangeopathy. These are things of benign biliary structure you will think on. But the dictum is if an isolated biliary structure is on a presentation, you should always rule out a malignancy. Supposing this is a malignancy which is coming for the first time, what, what, we, what is your bet on the diagnosis? Supposing this patient has been in North India and comes with a pain, shooting pain, again get a jaundice. Gallbladder carcinoma with the biliary malignancy can come, but the history okay. is different. But of course, if you are thinking of a malignancy, that's only one that will fit in. Otherwise, you don't have any other pain suggestion. What is the age of the patient? 27, sir. 27. Uh, 27. And this is in North India. North India. Yeah. Unusual yeah. for a GB carcinoma. Okay. It's much more disease of the elderly group, no? Past middle age. Shall we move on, sir? Among the, among the various carcinoma, as Professor Venkat mentioned, just enumerate the various carcinoma which can affect the bile duct and produce right. obstruction. So you have a list of three, four diseases. You just think which is the most likely possibility. Phalangeo carcinoma, sir. Okay. Phalangeo carcinoma can be in the hyla region or it can be in the anywhere. Distal. No? Oh. distal also. Okay. Or ampullary carcinoma. Ampullary. Then? The HCC with the CBD infiltration. That is very unusual. There is something which is more common in our locality. A gastric carcinoma with the uh, maybe but uh, when you consider bile duct uh, neoplasm, we consider one pancreas, the ampullary region, the bile duct per se, and the hilar region. Then, of course, gallbladder carcinoma. Then you said about uh, met hilar metastasis. Okay, so these are probably five or six uh, common causes which you have to consider. Among okay. this, which one you will consider in this? If you are compelled to make a diagnosis of malignant malignancy, pancreatic carcinoma. Is there anything in the history which is suggestive of pancreatic? Has he got any pancreatic pain? Sir, but no. What are the usual types of pancreatic carcinoma producing biliary obstruction in in this part of the world? Maybe South India. Head does he have? Is the is he the correct age for? Pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma? No, no. Does he have a risk factor or symptomatology of chronic pancreatitis? No, sir. No. Does he have anything to suggest hereditary pancreatitis? No, sir. So there are no risk factors, no? Everything is against for a pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, no? Okay, next. Mm. We have... Oh. Uh, 
considered gold border carcinoma and probably thought it is less likely because he belongs to South India and the AG is also not in favor. Okay. Then Hila. Bile duct carcinoma, cholangial carcinoma itself. Yeah, it can occur in a still lower age group. Okay. Pain. Pain, uh, if there is any obstruction. Among all these cancers, which one will present with pain? GB, can, GB and pancreatic carcinoma. GB, agreed. Pancreatic carcinoma, agreed. Okay. I think that part is done well. Okay. Over to Professor Vankat. Can we go to the next slide? We'll see. Okay. Past history. Uh, there's no history of similar episodes in the past. Uh, patient gives history of fall from height uh, at, uh, 14 years of his age, um, 14 years back, and sustained a blunt injury over the abdomen for which he was admitted in a government hospital and conservatively managed, uh, which happened in 2008. And in 2012, he had developed multiple episodes of large volume, fresh blood mixed vomitus, treated initially in a government hospital with blood transfusion and apogeoscopy, probably banding. Then, uh, then he developed a recurrent UGA bleed on different occasions since then. On 2013, uh, 2016, and last episode was on 2021. And every time he was managed with blood transfusion and UGA scopy with banding. And also, he was started on, on oral medication and advised to continue the same. In between each episode, patient was completely normal. Patient never what had... was the age of the patient in 2008? 14. That is most important that you have to make. 13 years old. That, that, you know, he is now 27. Is... So well, yeah. this is actually a chief complaint, you know. We cannot be discussing about jaundice and pain and all when there's this strong history. You have to mention chief complaint, recurrent of a GIB from the age of 18 to 14 years. And uh, you, it would be nicer if you have put it at the age of 18. You have to mention the age. Of age. He was only 12 years. He was 12 what years is, what is the relevance of mentioning the onset of the age of upper GI bleed in such a scenario? Is it relevant or is it yes, just... Sir. All yes, of sir, those are adamant. What is the relevance of that? First decade, uh, AHPVO and uh, congenital hepatic fibrosis can present with UGA bleed. Okay, the, good. The NCPF, uh, non serotic portal hypertension, usually presents in second and third decade. Okay, good. So, in uh, 2000... Uh, 2008, that is at the age of 14, bleed, he had an, a, a blunt okay, injury to abdomen, no? But you did not so, give much details. Was he in okay, ICU? Uh, was, what was told to him? Was there any organ damage? How many days he was in the hospital? Was he on illorally? Uh, was a CT scan taken? Uh, no. How many things are there for a uh, blunt injury to the abdomen? No? You said was the blunt injury to the abdomen? He, he, had a injury. he remained in the hospital for a few days, observed and came back. Or was he in an ICU? Was, uh, were there any major organ damage? Whether there is hepatic rupture, whether there is splenic rupture, whether there is intestinal damage, whether there is a hemoglobin. All these things you mentioned. No, so or did he develop develop any post-traumatic pancreatitis? So here he was admitted, sustained a blunt injury to the abdomen, but then conservative. So when you have a blunt injury to the abdomen, sir, the abdominal catastrophes can happen. Tell me. Um, he can develop splenic rupture. Um, yeah. Uh, can go for pancreatic pseudosis later. No, no, you can uh, have dramatic pancreatitis. 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 You can have a dramatic pancreatitis. pancreatitis with or without ductal disruption. If there's a ductal disruption, you can go for a pseudosis. Or have had a total thrombosis. Rheumatism uh, does not produce both for thrombosis. But what you can develop is what uh, what uh, what uh, you you could have developed is some sort of a uh, contusion to the liver or hepatic rupture. Since he was conservatively managed and no surgical thing was seen, that means there should have been either a contusion to the liver, you would have had post-traumatic acute pancreatitis or you would have had a splenic injury. Okay. okay. So in 2012, that four years later, up to from 2008 to 2012 is okay. Now, he started having large volume of uh, hematemesis for which banding was there. That means obviously he has got, he had varices. Yes, sir. What's your diagnosis in this patient? So, since this happened in his first decade, it could be 
extrapatic portal vein obstruction. So you would have had, you think uh, when he was following itself, he had EHP. No, his uh, GI period was when he was 18 years, no? No, no, 12 years old. 2008, he is now 27. 27. 2000, no, in 2008, he was 14. He was only 12 years old. So what so is... He was, Okay, so what do you think would have happened? He has got EHPVO. Okay, okay. He's got EHPVO. You really think it's because of the injury he developed EHPVO? You said something about portal vein thrombosis. Yes, sir. What is? What did you mean by that? I, in, in it could be portal vein thrombosis could be idiopathic in, in this patient, or I thought it could be due to blunt trauma. Any blunt injury, abdomen. So what is the incidence of portal vein? Portal vein will not get unless there is a uh, there is a laceration to the liver or the portal vein rupture. That would have been a catastrophe. They would have taken up surgery when the portal vein and all of what it would have been an ICU. You will be an ICU. You will just and you would have been told that it's a serious condition because the prognostication and all would have been explained. Like 2008. Right. So yeah. you should get all the things. Was as sir said. Was he in ICU? Was he given blood transfusion? Was he kept in the ICU or something? Was any surgery done on after bulk trauma? Or did he have any rise tube for a long time because it would have been a traumatic pancreatitis? So here, in 2012, he developed this. So I, it, it looks as if that he had an EH, EHP vivo much earlier to that. When he fell down and got conservatively managed, he would have had either a liver contusion or a splenic contusion. And he came off. In 2012, he started having had a hematemesis, isn't it? Yes, sir. 2012, he had a hematemesis. So, obviously, he has had a portal hypertension. So, the portal hypertension uh, could have been, I'm not very sure how much a blood injury causes portal hypertension, but my guess is he's got a, a pre existing EHP vivo. He fell down. He would have had a contusion in the liver or in the spleen. Even a spleen contusion, I think they would have operated on him if he has had a, if he has had a splenic injury. Most of the time, splenic injuries, especially if it is HBO and a large splenomegaly, if you have a contusion, they bleed. You would have undergone a splenectomy. Probably didn't have a splenic injury and he probably had something very minor and got discharged. What is your relevance of recurrent UJ bleed on 2013, 16, and 21? Uh, worsening portal hypertension. No, it may not be worsening portal hypertension. What does this frequency of bleeds, the large uh, large amount of periods between each bleed, what does it tell you? You think he has got cirrhosis or you think of extra hepatic portal hypertension? Uh, extra hepatic portal hypertension. Uh, because these bleeds are well tolerated and after every episode, she was almost normal. In between, yeah, so uh, everywhere they are normal and it is coming in between after three years, after five years. Yes, sir. Basically, he had one banding, but I don't think he was adequately obliterated and it is getting at such large intervals possibly we are dealing with an extra hepatic portal hypertension. If the bleed has been at the age of first time at the age of 15 or 16 years, what is a, what's your diagnosis? A well tolerated bleed in a 16 year old male. Uh, non serotic portal fibrosis it could be. EHP. Oh. The diagnosis will be an EHP followed by non serotic portal hypertension. And basically, you said there is no abdominal distension and jaundice and altered sensorium in the past. No other histories or no ma major surgeries in the past. So, no major surgeries in the past means during the blunt injury, there was not much of an uh, injury to the spleen. Yeah. Required. Yes. Maybe if at all, you got a contusion. Spreading contusion can be dangerous, especially when it's dangerous. But liver will tolerate that well. And if it's had a recurrent UGI bleed starting from the age of 15 years or 14 years and with a large amount of uh, periods of bleed and bleeds are occurring at larger intervals, uh, not more frequent with no decompensation, the first diagnosis is EHP. Okay. And the patient has got an EHP and now comes with jaundice. One minute. Can I just intervene? Abdominal pain. What is your diet? LB, LBK, can I just intervene? Yeah. Yeah, this, uh, can you give some more description of this fall from the height and all? He fell from the fourth, fourth flight of stairs, 10th flight of stairs. How does he know that he had, how did the patient know he had blunt injury of the abdomen? 
what tells you he may have just had fractures all over? What is the height of fall? And uh, is there any relationship of the bleed to that fall? I have not understood anything from the fall. He didn't have any fracture, ma'am. No, no, it's not fall. No, that means what is the height? I just want to know what is the height of the fall. He fell from second flight of stairs, fourth flight of stairs, right. tenth flight. Or he just slipped and fell from the staircase and he fell down. And how does he know he had a blunt injury of the abdomen? What makes you think that he has a blunt injury of the abdomen? That history may have of no relevance. And all that Dr. VT and Dr. LBK were stressing is we need to get more information on that. Okay. Sometimes you get a whiplash injury when the person falls in a swimming pool, you know, when they die. You get a whiplash injury, you can get a ductal, ductal rupture of the pancreatic duct. You have to be very careful, you know. See, when you describe this, for me it is, I would definitely ask for the height of fall. I would ask, definitely 12 years, at least his parents would tell what happened. But the patient himself would not know what happened. And your commitment that he had blunt injury over the abdomen. You know, we had patients where the bullock cart has, the wheel of the bullock cart has gone over the abdomen. No one of a dog, see the doctor's son had that. And you heard you know, the people falling from a height. We've also had people where a huge plank of wood has fallen on the back that resulted in diaphragmatic hernia. So we know all these injuries, but for the patient to tell that he had blunt injury of the abdomen, uh, to me and to the height from which he fell is very important in this particular situation. Okay. I think all the residents should read about the blunt injury or penetrating injury of the abdomen because these are probably never discussed in our clinics. But if you have a case like in the examination, you will get all the questions. All the questions. All the questions because liver trauma, bile duct, we did not discuss bile duct trauma, pancreatic trauma, pancreatic disruption, so, uh, splenic trauma, intestinal trauma, ischemia are due to mesenteric artery thrombosis, mesenteric liver injury. Thrombosis. Portal vein thrombosis, hemo peritoneum, hmm? all and, these. Uh, and liver injury, sir. Liver injury, type yeah. of liver injury. Is it a confusion or rupture? What is the grade of liver injury? It's grade one, two, three, four. Then splenic. What do you do? How do you manage? When do you do surgery? When do you do angiographic embolization? All these things you have to read. Supposing you give one history like this, we can just take you through into the blunt injury to the abdomen and discuss with it. Okay. So it should be thorough, right? And, was, and, and probably there won't be any discussion on the initial symptomatology. Initial symptoms the or the jaundice at all. Maybe it is hovering around your that abdominal injury. Okay. okay. It may get completely okay. in a different tangential direction. So at least theoretically, you should know where it is for problems related to an injury abdomen. Can we proceed? Including, proceed, yeah. including bullet injury. Yeah. So coming to personal history, uh, patient is a bachelor, he denies any form of Dr. addiction. Dr. Viti and Dr. LVK, the GI bleed, I think, should come as a chief complaint. Not discuss everything about jaundice and abdominal pain, and then you say it's in the past. So it's a cholestatic jaundice pain. Because I'm just wondering, because there were no prodromal symptoms, no alcohol, no drugs, everything was no. But now we have one positive history here. Then I, I, at least I would have definitely brought in, I would not discuss about the blunt injury, that I put it as fast. But I'll definitely bring in the recurrent we have bleed from the age of 12. John this for two weeks, abdominal pain for two weeks. So Maybe you should have started off with that uh, bleed from the... It has to come. It has to come as a present history. It has to come in the past. present history. Okay, get into past. the present history. Fine. See, we okay. know where dealing with. So you better get in this so that you build up the case. Yeah, and the other thing was the patient know. on any maintenance treatment with Indran or any other medication. He's just coming. coming, <laughs> he's coming that is most important, doctor. So once you get that history and then you bring in the jaundice, it becomes so easy to discuss the case. Yeah, Gishama, I understand your predicament. The predicament is that uh, this part is not uh, told by the patient immediately and you actually fish it out from the past history. But see, you have to be a consultant the very next day you pass the examination. So now it is not your third year or MBBS style of presentation which is expected now. We expect it like a consultant. Understand? So uh, this person with the multiple episodes of the well-tolerated GA bleed then presented with jaundice. Okay. Yeah. That would have made our thinking process much right, no? Rather than okay. think 
retro, uh, retrovet, no? And this is a straightforward case, no? Now you'll have H HBV coming, HCV coming, and PCC, that's all. Only three different genes. Okay. So he has been way. given some blood transfusions, no? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, patient, he denies any form of addiction. There was no history of any high-risk behavior. No history of similar illness among family members. No history of any cancer among the family other, members. other thing is, don't say denies, denies. It looks as though you want him to have it. No, don't use all that. That's not, that's all. There's no extra. That's just make it very simple. No history of any addictions. Okay. That's all. Okay. Denies, okay. denies means you want it to be there. You want it to be there. It's not there. Deny technically is that you have found out that he has addiction and then he is denying it. Yeah, no? denying That's it, the exactly. correct English That's meaning of that. It. That's the meaning of denial. Okay. So, come on, summarize. And... No, so, he's so... taking his own tablet propanol. Ah, he, yes, ma'am, he's on tablet propanol. So now, have you, doctor, have you understood? So I would say that chief complaints referred to upper GRB from the age of 12. John this for two weeks. And um, what's the other thing? Abdominal, abdominal pain also we not discuss. And discuss the jaundice and then and merge it with the pain. So there's nothing more there. There's severe pain, occurring of the food, intense and big, all that is just, you know, making, we're just making a little masala out of that history. So only uh, two chief complaints. Discuss the pain, discuss the GIV, don't bring in the, don't bring in the surge, don't bring in the fall. Recurrent upper GRB, and in the past, antedating some time back, he had there is a history of trauma, and then say related to that and not related to that. And then you bring in the jaundice now. In the jaundice, you have to bring in now in your mind what are the possibilities in this patient transfusion and injury and that person. You have either polystatic jaundice is there, and HBD or HCV, drug induced is not there, BE is not there. And then next is PCC. So just bring in more into the history in such a way that. You know, like, I mean, after your jaundice and abdominal pain, I was lost. I didn't know what was happening to the patient. But once you came out of this, the diagnosis is quite straightforward. Okay, now you just, just try summarize, to the, summarize the case. Try to understand. You can go to the summary. So, it's a 27 year old male with uh, no, no comorbidities or no surgeries in the past, who's a tea toddler and non smoker, had recurrent history of UGA bleed since his teenage, now presented with history of jaundice and upper abdomen pains since two weeks, pruritus with pale colored stools uh, since one week, with uh, no history of any fever, weight loss, abdomen distension, or altered sensorium or cam intake, and without so, any prodromal symptoms. Pro so, just, uh, just give all the issues in this patient. He presented with jaundice. Yes, sir. Jaundice. Uh, short, no, wait, wait. short history of jaundice. Acute onset of jaundice. He has had uh, polystatic symptoms. Yes. Sir. He had a uh, recurrent bleed from the age of 13 or 14 years with uh, long intervals of bleed without no decompensation. So, if somebody comes to you and he has received some. So, what does he have? What are the issues he has now? No, he's having cholestatic jaundice. Oh, first thing is, what is the most important thing he has? He has got a portal hypertension. Portal, yes, portal hypertension. You think he's got a hepatocellular or cirrhosis of liver or it's predominantly a portal hypertension presentation? It's a presentation of the portal hypertension. Portal hypertension. He is not decompensated. So, if he has got a portal hypertension at 27 years, what is your what is your differential diagnosis of portal hypertension in this patient? <coughs> no, uh, non serotic uh, uh, NCPF, sir. Non serotic portal fibrosis. So, if this is not at sometime at 13 years of age, and then you say now you think what is it? So, most common will be extra hepatic portal vein obstruction. He started breeding when he was 13 or 14 years old. Isn't it? Yes, sir. 2012, now 27. Thought he was 15 years old at that time. Isn't it? He had it in 2012, 13, 16, 21. So he has got a portal hypertension. And both the time, all the time banding was there. He never decompensated. So the cause of portal hypertension per one will be EHP VO, number one. Number two. NCPIH is always yes. a diagnosis in patients with EHPV. Yes, sir. Mm. Number, Due to three, number three. Due to repeated blood transfusion. Wait, wait, wait. And number three, he may have even uh, some cryptogenic cirrhosis or some congenital hepatic fibrosis which is there. 
That is one issue. So, he has an issue of portal hypertension with a recurrent bleed. The last bleed is 21 and he has not decompensated. So, we have got these diagnoses. Now, for the two, there is a history of jaundice for the last two weeks. Yes, sir. When was the last blood transfusion given? 2021. 21. So, he has got a, uh, he has got a, a jaundice of two weeks with an abdominal pain. So, what are the differential diagnoses in this setting for your jaundice? Two week history of jaundice with polystasis. You were telling something related to blood transmission. What were, what were you what, trying so to So, what are the causes of jaundice? That's what Sir is on. So, we want to know what are the causes of jaundice in this patient. It has come the last two weeks with abdominal pain. From 2021, there was nothing. Now, we have got jaundice with abdominal pain in a setting of an EHPO or NCPH. What are the possibilities? This portal biliopathy. Extra hepatic. Okay. Patient had two week history of jaundice with sudden this thing. Can it be viral? Yes, sir. Uh, due to the uh, history of uh, recurrent uh, repeated blood transfusion, are there, I think. Uh, so I will say that's a reactivation of hepatitis B. Hepatitis B. Any acute hepatitis will can can have an abdominal pain. Yes. So one, it can be viral. The okay. pain was not very typical, no? no. Of any pain was not very typical of biliary colic. Number two, it could be any virus. It could be just be a viral hepatitis starting with it. Not every viral hepatitis comes with a prodrome. You should know how many percentage of people viral hepatitis do not come with a prodrome. 20, 20, 20, 20 to 30 percent. They may not come with a prodrome. prodrome. So, viral hepatitis. so in your history, you should have asked for a history of travel elsewhere. As he travels somewhere and come eaten and come. Okay. So now it could be viral hepatitis. Number two. I do think he was on proper drug, call. That doesn't drug, in, drug induced liver injury. I think he has not had any drug. So some so if he has had a portal hypertension, okay, he should yes, have sir. spleen. Isn't it? Yes, yes. Sir. And probably he might be hemolysing also. So what can happen? Yeah, stones can. We could have just had a Gallstones, process. Number three. Oriental. Portal biliopathy we will consider, but I, I think we should go this way because portal biliopathy is something which comes very slowly. It doesn't come chuck like that and do it. So you may have some itching early on. Then the algorithm goes up and then they come with jaundice. This is too abrupt a history. If you straightly say portal biliopathy, then they'll say you have got the clue. So you should discuss, you know, we want to know how you discuss these patients. Madam and BD, anything else? Uh, I want to just ask uh, two things. Uh, he, he might have had blood, how many blood transfusion he had? How many units? Uh, in every time he got admitted, he was having blood transition, he told sir. Okay. So, he must be told happened in from 2016. 12, 13, 16, like that, no? So, four now, what are the chances four that times. he get a blood transfusion associated? Suppose, uh, it was the first transmission was in 2012, sir. 2012. 12. 2012. Okay. So, what are the chances of him having hepatitis B or C due to transmission? So, because it is mandatory that every blood bank should check for hepatitis B and C infection. Yes, sir. Okay. So, if that is done, how is it possible that he developed hepatitis B or C? Is it still possible that in spite of a good blood bank practice, they develop hepatitis B or C? Is it possible? Yes, yes sir. How? How is how? it possible? How is no. it possible? Patient could have been, there is always called a window period in incubation. Yes, sir. Could have, yes, been, sir. Could have been window period. Oh, the donor might have been in a window period of the hepatitis B or C infection. And the, and the classic tests like HBSAG or anti HCV, even if ELISA is done, may not be positive. 
So what are the uh, surrogate markers uh, by which you try to find whether this uh, person is possibly in that phase? What are the way, what is the current method of uh, testing in various blood banks? To be absolutely sure that you will not transmit uh, hepatitis what B. What testing is this right. Is it LICV, what they do? Is it LICV? Okay, we just now told that with the current LISA technique, still it is possible that the person might uh, uh, be included as a uh, potential donor and the blood may be taken and still you can, the person can develop hepatitis B or C. So the blood banks have gone a step further and they do further testing. What are those tests known as? Have you heard of nucleic acid testing? Sir, nucleic acid ampli. Okay. Olden days, people were, in olden days, people were looking at and which were very insensitive. Uh, but now I think nucleic acid test is the one. Am I right, Professor Venkat? Yes, sir. NAT is what is now considered to be the test of all these things. The gold standard. The gold standard. Nucleic acid amplification test. Yes. Okay. Okay. okay, so theoretically it is possible. Second question will be the duration. For hepatitis B and C to evolve into cirrhosis of liver, it usually takes uh, quite some time. Quite some time. So is the duration from 2012 to 2023. Uh, but he, he would have developed a GA bleed. Uh, so <laughs> unless you think that there's an ESPV on top of which he has developed a hepatitis B or C infection and then gradually progress. So, do you think he has developed cirrhosis or it's only uh, a chronic hepatitis phase? Uh, it's chronic hepatitis phase. But now jaundice may be due to? Due to the current jaundice. Now it is a, a quite significant jaundice. Now, how do you explain the jaundice if it is due to chronic hepatitis B or C? How do you explain the deep jaundice? Deep jaundice. Normally, the chronic hepatitis, they have got a smoldering disease and mild hyperbilirubinemia, transaminase abnormality is very often found out by lab testing, you know. But why suddenly this person has developed jaundice, clinically manifest jaundice, noticed by his relatives, uh, and uh, he has come with a fairly significant jaundice and cholestasis. This is due to reactivation. Professor Bengata just mentioned it earlier. Reactivation. Okay. TB super infection perhaps is not seen in India. Uh, uh, I, I don't think we have significant HDV infection on HBV in India in spite of uh, the uh, chances of IV drug use and all. But I think luckily we don't have much. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have, a, I am not very aware of an HDV super infection in India. Is it there? Super infection is not there. If CV comes as chronic hepatitis, if it comes as acute hepatitis, it comes off as some sub subclinical illness and it goes away. But uh, unless you think uh, so, you might have a chronic HCV, but the jaundice can be something else. But most possibility can be this as said, that it could be chronic hepatitis B due to a blood transfusion. And now he's got a reactivation. If you had an acute hepatitis, what will be the incubation period of hepatitis B? Two months to uh, 15 to 150 15 days. To one, yes. 15 to 150 days. days. So, if it has been acute, you would have developed it during the first transmission, maybe after even after 150 days. But if you think he has acquired an infection, this could have been a reactivation. You would have had a chronic hepatitis B. This is how you discuss this case. Okay, okay. don't go straight to portal be open. Okay. okay, then they will definitely know that you have a We want to know how, how your thought process goes. Yeah, Obviously. we are not much bothered about the, the, the final diagnosis. diagnosis. What is your thought yeah, in fact, if you clinch the diagnosis and tell us exactly what the patient has, actually we will have suspicions. Then we will have suspicion that you have had a clue. Okay. 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 I think until now it is... Uh, so at this patient. point of time, you list out your diagnosis now. You list out the syndromic diagnosis in this patient. Okay. So a case of uh, polystatic jaundice. It's my syndromic diagnosis uh, with background history of recurrent UGA bleed. Uh, it's a case of EHPVO with uh, 
now with extra hepatic biliary obstruction secondary to post portal biliopathy no he has got okay he is basically got a portal hypertension no yes sir portal hypertension could so he has got a extra hepatic portal vein obstruction and he's got a polystatic jaundice by polystating and straight away you put a secondary to portal biliopathy i think first maybe viral hepatitis in this viral hepatitis it could be probably an acute yep. hepatitis due to a or b or if it's it has to reactivation be, of b reactivation and the second one for a jaundice could be because he had a pain and all he would have had a gallstones and a cholecystic process third he may still have portal biliopathy but if the portal biliopathy has to come suddenly in two weeks time with a with a pain i still think there should be some cholecystic even in the setting of yeah, a, i think superadrenal and balls all of balls superadrenal cbd is not likely will come slowly over a period of time they will develop itching and then they develop jaundice and then they come they will never be having this pain and all all those things they come very gradually and then that's how they come okay now with your two week history that's what i'll think i'll think this probably be a reactive fp it could still be hepatitis a or e how do you know we know that 30% of patients do not come with a prodromal symptoms the second possibility could be the thing for the portal hypertension the second other possibilities could be non serotic intrahepatic portal hypertension congenital hepatic fibrosis they come with portal hepatitis but they don't come so much with the recurrent bleeds they also do come with recurrent bleeds okay if congenital hepatic fibrosis has come with sudden onset of cholestatic jaundice what do you call that carolis syndrome carolis um, syndrome carolis syndrome so that's what you think but here i think i would go this way that is a reactivation fp or fp or fp because the symptoms are very vague if you had had a hepatitis and jaundice which comes in two weeks and goes like that it could be a pleidocolithiasis due to gallstones in the gall bladder because he has already got a he would have in ehb you expect a big spleen and i expect this hemolysis to go on and third is it could be probably uh, secondary to portal biliopathy in even in biliopathy i would expect some sludge or some cbd calculus to obstruct before it comes to that comes to thing or there may be a stricture on which there is a sludge suddenly they don't come like this with pain and all if there is a pain in portal biliopathy it is obstructed by either a stone or a sludge over a stricture this is what we Can we move on, sir? Physical exam, yeah. Uh, so, patient with general physical exam, sir. Patient was conscious, oriented, time, place, and person. Uh, hydration was fair. Few scratch marks noted over the abdomen extremities. Patient was afebrile. Uh, no pallor. Uh, deeply ectric. No cyanosis. No clubbing. No pedal edema. No lymphadenopathy. Peri peripheries appeared to be thin. Morphinoid habitus present. There was. Uh, there were no signs of liver cell failure except ictus. This peripheries means what? Uh, 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 upper limb and lower limb appears to be thin. Okay, be specific. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay, morphinoid uh, habitus fine. His height was one seventy two centimeter. His weight of fifty kgs. Uh, his BMI is sixteen point nine four. And uh, mid arm circumference in right uh, upper limb was twenty one centimeter and left was twenty centimeters. But pulse was eighty eight per minute. Regular in rhythm. With the volume normal. Equally felt in all extremities. His blood pressure was one forty by ninety millimeter mercury in left arm supine position with respiratory rate of eighteen per minute with abdominal thoracic pattern. Abdominal jugular reflex was negative. Uh, saturation was ninety nine percent at room air at both sitting and uh, supine posture. The stomach examination, uh, inspection, a mild upper abdominal fullness noted. Umbilicus appears to be in midline. There were scratch marks noted over anterior abdominal wall. And all quadrants move equally with respiration. No scars, sinuses, visible veins over the abdomen. The hernial orifices are free, and genitals appear normal. Palpation on superficial palpation there was no warmth and non-tender. There was uh, on deep palpation mild tenderness present at epigastrium and right hypochondrium. The spleen is palpable seven centimeters below the left costal margin. So it's firm in consistency. So smooth surface and splenic notch felt. No other abdominal organs palpable. Hernial orifices are free. I think here you have to specifically mention about liver, no? Because there is jaundice and pain, right hypochondrium, and you are suspecting liver, liver is palpable. Jaundice, you should have liver is not palpable. No organs palpable. You should have mentioned specifically that liver. We are speaking okay. something in the liver, no? Okay, liver is not palpable. 
on percussion the liver span is 10 cm the drop space dull was, uh, dullness was noted on percussion there was no free fluid in auscultation bowel sounds are audible no venous hum or other added sounds on rectal examination there are po no perianal lesions gloves were stained with pale yellow stools other system examination the cardiac uh, the ball ball sounds... ball no sir not palpable that also, that also should have been positively mentioned. This is a case yes. of uh, uh, possible obstructive jaundice, no? So, in okay. the inspection, no gallbladder. But he asked, uh, how do you calculate liver span? Liver is not palpable. You percus, you per show the liver say the mid axillary line. So, it is percussion method. Yeah. Yes, sir. The so percussion, percussion liver span of things. Okay. Uh, and the uh, cardiac. Uh, car a cardiovascular system, heart sounds 1 and 2 present, no murmurs, respiratory system, bilateral air entry present, no other added sounds, central nervous system, no focal neurological deficits noted. So, what are your findings? So, with, uh, in our examination, the positive findings are patient was deeply thick with morphine habitus. And, um, per abdomen examination, it was tenderness in the right hypochondrium with uh, uh, splee, moderate splenomegaly was there. What is pandemonus hypochondrium means a huge area, no? So, if we are suspecting a biliary disease, uh, if, can you just say where exactly was the tenderness? Actually, he felt tenderness both at the... He, he felt tenderness both at the epigastrium and right hypochondrium, sir. So, it's a, it's a spread out over epigastrium and hypochondrium. And hypochondrium. Okay. So, now my differentials are... It's a case of extra hepatic portal vein obstruction with ESPO secondary to portal biliopathy. Or it's a non serotic intrahepatic portal hypertension with portal biliopathy. But still, they have not really ruled out uh, any reactivation of hepatitis B or uh, any post viral hepatitis. Or I thought that and since he's having. How do you dogmatically say this only portal biliopathy? Since he's having. Uh, I, I thought the patient was having moderate splenomegaly. That's okay. No, the by, by, no, in the background, there is a you ESP, expect the spinomegaly because no, we, we don't disagree. We don't agree. That's because spinomegaly is not that's what I'm trying to tell you. It's not always portal biliopathy. You still have the history. We cannot rule out viral hepatitis, we cannot rule out uh, uh, just a CBD calculus in this patient or a portal biliopathy. Yeah, plain straightforward CBD calculus, <laughs> viral hepatitis. How can you rule out portal biliopathy? Portal biliopathy is a imaging diagnosis. Okay. Everybody gets the same thing. Okay. So, still, according to ST and clinical findings, you said the liver span is only 10 centimeters. The liver mass went 10 percent because chronic body vein obstruction could have shrunk on the liver a bit. But still, you cannot rule out <coughs> a CBD stone <coughs> or a reactivation of hepatitis. I think we can ask the other two presenters also, the discussions also, their differential diagnosis. Is it possible that the patient has just got splenic vein thrombosis? And, and that's caused for the recurrent GIB, fundal varicine bleed. We have been no idea whether this band was placed. We said EDA was done. And jaundice is totally unrelated to the EH. Possible. You have to keep Did they specifically system. say banding was done or was it only endotherapy? Uh, he told sir, banding. Uh, he told uh, rubber, band, rubber bands are up. Uh, like that, he told sir, banding bands are up. He told. So it can be anything. Uh, uh, a trauma with pancreatitis. <coughs> Chronic vein thrombosis. Then you could have had a recurrent uh, fungal virus. Oh, okay, you said banding the release of the virus. Okay. But still, at the end of the history, what do you say, ma'am? I don't think uh, it, uh, it no, can. No, 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 no. Jaundice has been. Well, only portal biliopathy, portal biliopathy. You harp on that. We would have appreciated when we have said that, okay, this could, my, my deficient diagnosis does not change despite the thing. It could be EHPV was one diagnosis, portal hypertension, EHPVO. And the jaundice, I still maintain that it could be a reactivation of everything. You have to consider that, absolutely. And, and, uh, and uh, this could be a gallstone. It could be a CBD stone, gallstone and CBD. And portal billion. I don't think uh, you In can CIPH also will not do things easy. and say it is only. You keep on harping that we know very well that you got a clue. And uh, that's what happens. Okay, so you should still maintain that diagnosis. Because your first symptom was abdominal pain, no? Abdominal, significant abdominal pain. No, that's what you said. Ah, so abdominal pain, jaundice for two weeks. Abdominal pain is a little uh, difficult to digest. It's a sharp pain which is going up on the food and all. So we still cannot rule out cholidopathy. 
Can we ask the other two questions, Sai Kiranmai and Sobin? What do they think? Yes, sir, I would st still like to consider jaundice may not be a part of EHP or related or can be due so to viral loss. So you think it is not only unrelated to EHP? So what is your list of differential diagnosis for the current problem? Uh, because he is having risk factors for viral hepatitis, I would like to consider viral hepatitis. Which viral hepatitis? Hepatitis B or hepatitis C, sir. So the, you, uh, your first diagnosis is only viral hepatitis with uh, cholestasis? Cholestasis with the pre-existing portal hypertension secondary to HPV. Oh, oh, that means uh, on, on top of a background HPV. Okay. You don't, you don't have any other differential diagnosis? Mm. CBD calculate. No, no. If you consider yes or no, that's it. What about Sobin? Is he there? Sir, my first study would be uh, on the background of EHPVO. Uh, now the current episode of jaundice may be due to polydocolithiasis first. Then uh, second will be reactivation of uh, Hep B. And uh, third may be secondary. So both of you will not consider portal carbondoma associated cholangiopathy. Short duration of history. Is there any way by which we can bring in portal cavernoma associated cholangiopathy and the current scenario? Is there any way we can link, link this? Yeah, it was discussed by Professor Venkat, no? Like the present patient method, might be the gallstone, the gallstone can produce, uh, uh, can migrate or it can produce uh, some uh, pain. It can produce uh, polydocolithiasis or there may be the, 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 the may, may be due to a partial structure. There could be sludge in the bile duct and producing uh, obstruction, no? These are the different causes by which even the pre-existing cholangiopathy, the person may present acutely. The most acute will be a stone. Yes. Okay, little but less acute will be the sludge and the uh, obstruction due to that. Okay. Thank you. We cannot totally disregard that, but I think you should have an explanation for that also. So I think this is how you discuss this case up to this point. Can we go to investigations, ma'am? Ma'am, you want to say anything else? Yeah, I think NCIP should not come as a DD number one. And let's think of all the childhood causes of cirrhosis, you know, which can present as potential childhood causes. Let's keep that in mind and then just ensure that those are not coming in the way of portal hypertension because it's now portal hypertension of more than 12 years. So the cirrhosis will not come in. So by now, you have decompensated. So chances of being EHPV is more likely. And uh, the NCIPF will not come as a baby. And the blunt injury is totally unrelated to this. It's not to this. Do you think he has enough uh, time gap uh, from the onset of uh, EHPV to portal bilopathy? So that is only around 13-14 uh, years, no? Sir. Only uh, time gap. In the case, repeated EVL, repeated EVL causes these polydocal places to open up. The more number of this thing they have, the rent, the rent is or the, the giveaway is towards the polydocal places. So the longer the duration, more chance of this is. Okay, so to say, Kiran Mai, what is the most common uh, uh, clinical presentation of portal bibliopathy in an ESPV? The jaundice and pruritus, sir. The most common is that they are asymptomatic. Yes, yes. They are most common is asymptomatic. Yeah. 80% are asymptomatic. 80% are not That should be the answer. The clinical presentation is in a small percentage. In fact, severely symptomatic will be 5 to 10%. And, and the investigation wise, they may find LFT abnormalities in around 20 to 30 percent, and the large 80 percent is remaining asymptomatic. But if you do a, a, a imaging like a MRCP, etc., you may find some findings. Okay, so that doesn't mean they present clinically. So, large percentage of portal cavernoma associated cholangiopathy is asymptomatic. Okay, we will ask them how to evaluate. Examination over. Examination? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, Examination, there was clean 7 centimeter, tenderness in the right hypochondrium, 
and uh, uh, liver span 10 centimeter and jaundice. That's no wings. No wings. No wings. No wings. No okay, wings. shall we investigate? Yeah, yeah. Uh, who is the next? Is it Sai? I will you investigate. Two minutes. <clears throat> I'd like to do a blood investigations and imaging, sir. In blood investigations, uh, I'd like to do a complete blood count because patient is having a portal hypertension with splenomegaly. I would like to look for a panspitopenia picture in the blood counts. Uh, and I would like to do a liver function test uh, to see, look at the bilirubin components, whether it's a direct or indirect, and alkaline phosphatase levels as well. And SGOT and SGPT look for any transaminitis. So you uh, look for indirect here? Uh, a patient might, because he's having a spleen, so hemolysis, there could be a component of indirect hyperbilirubinemia also. So you, you think it is indirect hyperbilirubinemia in this situation? The person no, sir, in this situation. The person having yellow-colored and uh, yellow urine, no? And polystasis. polystasis. No? And polystasis symptoms. So you expect, a, you expect a conjugated, no? Predominantly conjugated will hyperbilirubinemia. Yeah. So, is it possible to differentiate when you are conjugated and unconjugated together? It will be difficult, no? Yes. Okay, go ahead. And then I would like to look at the viral markers also because viral hepatitis is high among the cards. So, HBSAG and HCV, I would like to do. Um, and uh, creatinine levels, if at all we are planning for any further imaging, higher imaging, we would like to know his renal status. So we'd look at the creatinine also. Next. Next investigation, what will you do? I'll do an ultrasound abdomen, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, basically to look at the biliary tree because whether it is viral with hepatitis a Doppler, or... Doppler, with a Doppler. Mm -hmm. uh, USG abdomen with a Doppler. I look at the biliary tree whether any chance, any presence of IHBRT or a, a dilated CBD uh, and with a, any radiodent calicula in the CBD. Or I Doppler. GB. How is the GB? And then with the Doppler, answer, the presence of a portal cavernoma or associated collaterals replacing the cavernoma on Doppler and flow of the blood in the collaterals. On Doppler. What else? And spleen. Because my sister. What, what else? Are you have finished your investigations? Suppose this patient is under your care. Uh, you will you'll finish at this level? Oh, GI. Okay, so bin. Yes. Sir. What else? So then we have to look at the uh, CBD calculi. We have to do MRC. How do you look that. at? Go straight uh, to the point. MRC. Will you have higher imaging, no? Ah, uh, yes, sir. MRCP. Okay. Then don't you then look at the GA tract? Yeah, upper G endoscopy should also. Status be. of the viruses. Yes. yes sir. Okay. Do we have all this? Yes, sir. Report. Hemoglobin is 8.9, uh, lower side. Total count is 1,400 with a polymorphs of 77 and lymphocytes of 15. Uh, platelet count is 9,000. What is the of 67. Uh, Pancytopenia. Huh? Pancytopenia. Pancytopenia. What does it suggest? Pancytopenia agreed. Hypersplenism. Huh? Hypersplenism. So she has got uh, she's got uh trilene age is uh, cytopenia. So she's got pancytopenia. <coughs> okay. <coughs> and then low MCV because he has recurrent upper GA bleeds. Okay. ESR is 11 and investigation. Uh, total bilirubin is 8 with a direct component 
5.7, indirect 0.24, protein is 7.4, albumin is 3.9, which is normal, SGOT, SGPT elevated with hundreds, and alkaline phosphate is 198, slightly on a higher side, GGT 189, it is on a higher side, uh, urea creatinine normal, sodium is 139, and potassium is also normal. How do you interpret the LFT? Can you interpret the LFT? Direct, direct hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, with mild transaminitis and elevated al alpha. Mild transaminitis, almost four, five times around. Your SGOT, SGPT is 100. Mm -hmm. You got a direct bilirubinemia. ALP is elevated. Karmajit is elevated. What is the current uh, upper value ULN for uh, SGOT, SGPT? SGPT in male in and men, it is around 20. Not sure of exit values. 23 in males, 18 in females, SGPT. So it is, uh, if you can make it at 20, how many times is this? Five times. Five times, no? Almost five times. So it yeah. is significantly elevated liver enzymes. So with this liver enzymes and this jaundice, what are the possibilities you think of? Based you on our history. Is causing jaundice? Okay, can this be hepatitis? Can this be hepatitis? Can this just be hepatitis? Yes. Cholestatic hepatitis. What? Okay. With direct bilirubin. So it could still be cholestatic hepatitis. Cholestatic hepatitis. They have come after two weeks, so the enzymes could have come down by now. Enzyme would have come down. Yeah. That's a peculiarity. So by the time they develop cholestasis, the transaminase levels come down. Even the gamma GT, everything is gone. Okay. Some of them can be hepatitis. Can it be portal biliopathy alone? Yeah. What happens if cholangitis to the SGOT, SGPT? Or both? It increases. So, when you have, you cannot say this patient has got only portal bilirubin. When you have this sort of elevated liver enzymes and elevated enzymes more than five times the normal, elevated karma duty, if you have to encounter only portal, it's not possible. Even if there may be, a, this could still be a CBD stone. And it could, if there is a portal biliopathy, you could still have, I think, there may be an element of a cholidopolithiasis or a sludge over a stricture and he has come with pain. As Masser said, if it's a portal biliopathy, goes on asymptomatically, you will have a bilirubin of 2.1 and alphos of 200 without elevated liver enzymes. But most of the times it may be. So that means you may still have acute hepatitis, either a A, E, O, T, which is resolving. And second is, if he has got, he may have a CBD stone. If he has got a portal biliopathy, there should be some stone or a sludge occluding over a stricture or an arrow. Okay? This is how you interpret. So your RFT is normal. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, urine routine is positive with bile, bile salts and bile pigments, suggestive of cholestasis. MLAs and lipase are normal. INR is 1 point, PT is 14.7 seconds and INR is 1.32. Viral serology. Synthetic Hepat functions are normal because albumin is 3.9 and INR is 1.2. So next, what do you want to do? Viral markers. Hepatitis A, negative. B, C, E are negative. Next, what do you want? I would like to look at the ultrasound of the patient. Yeah, sir, we have the ultrasound. You said ultrasound plus Doppler. Yes. Sir, I don't have the image, sir. I couldn't collect. I have the report here. Look at that. Large calculus. So there's no liver is shrunken with liver. Okay, the first line. Liver is shrunken with the poor hepatic acrotexia. What is the explanation? Uh, one thing, liver shrunken, it can be a part of chronic EHPEO leading to peripheral segment contraction. Not cirrhosis. Okay. A small size liver is uh, very often seen in ESPV because long standing deprivation of hepatotrophic factors, the liver is very often not enlarged in people with ESPV. This was one of our studies just published in 1990s. Okay, I presented it in Rwanda, my ESC. Liver size is less in ESPV. Okay, uh, so shrunken liver is very often and some degree of uh, 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 worsening. RHM excitation can happen because of. Long-standing low blood flow. 
but we okay. don't of course of clinically also he said it's only okay, tetra look at the second line it says read the second line uh, dilated cbd of 11.7 mm in diameter in the large calculi of 10 yeah. mm in proximal cbd with ihbrd in both right and left side measuring 6.5 and 6.4 respectively so how do you say this both will you it's just a simple uh, calculus mm -hmm. okay. is it carolis it is there's nothing there is nothing there's nothing in the liver no pr is dilated mm -hmm. measure on the right and left side but there's a calculus in the proximal cbd maybe we release we release this cbd everything will go away that's a point you should keep on not harming on its portobello If this ultrasound along with i don't think it's portobello i just think it is a stone which is obstructing the bile what do you can say be, sir what do you say madam can it be carolis sir so only right wing left central ducts are dilated liver is shrunken with no sir, evidence of any no evidence of intrahepatic liver is shrunken is not because of cirrhosis is because of a low parenchyma exchange to the hp his pain jaundice is because of the stone If uh, if you if you have a portal biliopathy, you think IHBR will get dilated to six point five and six point four? No, there'll be sclerosing cholangitis like picture, so they'll not get dilated so much. It is dilated because of distal obstruction. That's what I keep telling you. Don't diagnose this and keep harping on the IHBO if they're portal biliopathy yeah. without yeah. analyzing the symptom. From the first time I said. you can't say it's only portal biliopathy you need to think of the stone if you have a right and left dilated what is the picture of a portal biliopathy it's like a sclerosing cholangitis there will be multiple strictures in the bile duct here where do you see and will the, if there are strictures already in the intrahepatic bile radicals you think it will get dilated to 6.5 and 7 no so this is nothing but a polydocolithiasis you would have had gall stones Had or you would have had because of hemolysis, you would have had a primary polydocolithiasis, which has produced an obstruction. And your liver enzymes, everything tells you that this is an obstruction due to a stone. The dilated CBD of one point one seven centimeter also tells that this CBD is also that is also again I am not able to say that because so, calculus is a proximal CBD. Dilated CBD is eleven point seven centimeter. Yeah, proximal CBD dilated <laughs> to such an extent is not a favor of. A, Uh, yes, B V. Yes, B V. Or total bilirubin. Yeah, most often uh, we have a stricture of the common hepatic duct hyla region, and the distal part of the bile duct is very often of normal size. This looks more like a carolis dilated CBD, dilated with stones. Okay, so forty nine. Only this dilated CBD. Ah, uh, G B G B. Yeah, this kind of the diagnosis stages of from. And EHPVO, you will not get uh, you will not get a portal vein thrombosis of congenital hepatic fibrosis and and uh, Carolis syndrome. So here, I think this is I don't know. There was already a, there maybe you do another imaging. There may be a calculus lower down. Why should uh, proximal CBD pro produce CBD of eleven point seven millimeters? Even the lower end should have been normal. I think proximal CBD dilatation is not a uh, proximal. CBD, proximal CBD. Because the distal CBD might not be seen properly. No, no, no. Because you are not mentioned. Okay. I think dilated okay. CBD eleven point seven large uh, calculus uh, proximal uh, CBD. So we have not seen the distal CBD. Okay. So, okay. So the narrowing could be still in the somewhere in the middle of CBD. Middle in middle this case, yeah. it's still possible. Yeah. We have not seen it properly. Okay. But they will well, not be uniform. Dilation. That is one of the IH, problems with the ultrasound. No, IHBR. They will not be uniform dilation right and left in a in a portal biliopathy because there is already there will be a lot of strictures. There will be something like sclerosing. They will not dilate to six point five millimeters. I think this is just a stone which has put dilation yeah. of the bile duct and IHBR. Isolated single structure somewhere on the middle of CBD is unlikely in ESPVO. You would expect multiple indentations in the upper part yeah, of the CBD in right. the in the hilar region, in the left and right duct, etc. No, so it is not an isolated single structure. So I think Professor Venkat is absolutely right. This is look, this is looking like a CBD stone disease. So, 
ിക്കോ <laughs> Can we go to the next slide? What have you done later? Yes. Need one more imaging. Yes. No? We need one more imaging. We would have expected you to do an at least MRCP prior to ERCP, no? Uh, MRI with MRCP because MRI with MRCP shrunken. would have given us a shrunken. better idea. The roadmap should be very clear before. Very clear. Like you should yeah. do an MRI before MRCP. You... Okay. And uh, is is there any extra precaution to be taken before doing ERCP in a patient with a suspected uh, EHPVO or in a EH or in a uh, uh, EHPVO with CBD stone? Is there an extra ECC. precaution? Need you look at here, there is a proximal CBD uh, stone and there's also a filling defect in the uh, uh, there's a proximal CBD filling defect in the proximal and distal CBD. I told you, no? So it could be a stone there and stone down if you think the CBD is so being dilated, I have to think. And uh, in, uh, in this, I'm not very sure we are commonly seeing uh, That's sort of a picture of the thing like this. So both the stones are remain and the stent was placed in the middle. Anything else was done? No MRCP. I would have done MRCP. Make sure the road room and then we would have done this. We have not done this. Can you just read out that? Uh, yes, After removing the stones and see if there's any portal biliopathy or not. Can you read out that ERCP finding for the benefit of all of us? Cholangiogram showed a dilated uh, CBD of 11.7 millimeters with the filling defects noted in the proximal and distal and CBD. And distal. Along with a sm smooth narrowing in the mid CBD. Okay. So maybe there was a more narrowing because of some sort so of... The, the filling defects both in the proximal and distal. So, but I think this is because there's a narrowing CBD. I think this has been a very asymptomatic portal biliopathy may be going on. And there are two stones uh, which had caused this acute problem. And uh, you will not get a dilated IHBRD and CBD. IHBRD on both sides if it is a, it is a portal biliopathy. So only if there are, if you consider portal biliopathy, in the mid-CDB there is a narrowing. But we still don't see any indentation. So, as I asked a question, what are the precautions needed for ERCP in a person with the EHPVO? Because uh, EHPVO patients will have so many collaterals in the CBD, in the submucosal and epithelial region. They are more prone for bleeding and air embolism. So, uh, during ERCP, we should be careful to replace air with the carbon Yeah, dioxide. sometimes even you may mistake it because a filling defect may be actually due to the intraductal, intra-polydocal varices. And you may go and try to pull it out with a dormia basket or a balloon seepage and all. You may produce rupture and uh, develop a significant bleeding. Okay, so one has to be extremely careful. If at all you have this, this is sort of narrowing. So if there's a stone here, there's a stone here. This part of it is narrow. So So maybe it's an early portal biliopathy, but uh, I think that the features are not very classical of portal biliopathy. Portal biliopathy will have all these uh, excavations of all that. There will all be a scalloping of all the bile ducts and it will have strictures in the multiple level. I think the diagnosis here was AHPV go with polydopolyphysis. Unless after you're removing the stone, you do an MRCP and see how it is. Then you take off the stent after two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. Okay. Is there a, will there be any color difference uh, uh, if it is a primary biliary disease or primary CBD stone? If there will be a color, what will be the color of the stone? Is there any study? Uh, primary the CBD stone, stone mostly brown color. Brown color. So this patient, the gallstones would have been formed due to what? Hemolysis. 
So, if there is excess strong form, excess tendency was strong formation due to background uh, hemolysis, the strong would be black color. What's the color here? Black. Right. Pigment stones. You don't say black. These are pigment stones. And correctly, you should talk. Okay. Don't say black and white stones. And all that. This is a, a DNB exam. This is not Suma, uh, you come and say something. Pigment stone. So, do we have any other uh, investigation? Any other uh, appreciated an uh, MRI with an MRCP? Because uh, after having talked so much about yeah, ESC, the uh, quarter condom associated the video, we would have been happy to see the MRCP picture, which would have given us you, a little uh, better after idea. You, after you uh, remove the stents, you kindly go on MRCP and see what's happening. Okay. But See, still also, I am also the, tempted to think that uh, there could be a sort of silent or a partial stricture of the bile duct, but this is all due to the cholidocolithiasis, which is probably unrelated. This to jaundice the, is because of cholidocol. I don't yeah. think I ever say it is photobiliopal. See, we don't know the case, but the way it went, the presentation, we thought it was, uh, you, so you should know the natural history of each PVO. This is predominantly two stones were causing it and the pain, everything. So that's how they'd argue out a case, no? I never know the case till you told us, but I still kept on saying, based on the history, physical presentation, and your LFT, total biliopathy will not have elevated liver enzymes. There has to be some, I told, there has to be some stone or a stitch which could the problem detect because the enzymes have gone up. Okay, Dr. Okay. Mishra. Okay, sir. That's how you think. You see the LFT, it is 100, 110. We will not get it in a... Asymptomatic portal biliopathy and jaundice. Asymptomatic. Yeah, actually, alphas, which is very elevated. slowly, actually. And only in acute onset, they should be complicated by, uh, there may be a small narrowing. That's what I told you. Maybe there's a small stricture. On top of it, there should be a stone or a sludge. With the cholangitis, yeah. That With can produce uh, elevated transaminases. Uh, Sobin, where are you? Yes, sir. Do you have any okay, more suppose slides? It was, okay, suppose uh, we had a stricture and a small stone above and if you diagnose it as the uh, really portal biliopathy and we have done an, uh, uh, we have done a temporary procedure to get rid of the obstructive jaundice. How do you manage the case further? If you leave it like that, are you happy now? At least for theoretical sake, how do you manage portal biliopathy? What are the broad guidelines? They need to know the classification also. Yeah, that's a classification. Yes. Do you know? There is a whole issue in our cellar. By Journal of Clinical Agar and Expert on Hematology, there is a whole issue on post-pediopathy. Find out how many are asymptomatic, how it progresses, what is type 1, 2, 3, 4, how do you manage, what is the management, what are the surgical managements, what is the indication of a low-level Madam? Demons. Demons. Yeah, no, there is a whole issue of inner cell. That's right. Demon is the one who is classified that. So, you, you should be able to come to a diagnosis, analyze it well, the history, everything. You kept again, actually, the element of total biliopathy is very, very low in this. You need to really okay. broad and broad. Okay. Okay. So in the beginning, we told one thing now. If you say the precise diagnosis, okay, we will we'll not be very happy. Happy. You have to be very, you have to, you have to be broad in your differential diagnosis. Okay. Sir. I just returned from a DNB exam. So, so how will you manage? Uh, the, is it okay? Just uh, uh, manage, uh, do a stand, put a stand here and then forget about it? Or what do you do? No, we have put a stand. This is uh, discussing the management. Yeah, so, so how do you manage it? So, Bin, are you there? Otherwise, we'll ask uh, Krishnamar or Sai. We, because they have Put the plastic stent here. Uh, there's a chance of blockage for more than three months. So uh, we should do a stent removal and when do you, a cholangiogram. When you do a plastic stent, a what is your what is your uh, what at what at how many uh, how many times you exchange in a year? Three times, sir. Three to four times. Three to four times. 
supposing he says i don't want to exchange then can you put a fully covered metallic stem uh, in this case i doubt it sir because he is having a ehpo some intraductal collaterals with a metallic stem high chance of metallic stem no we can put metallic stem no you have you have done a spring rot me you can easily put a metallic stem but what is not preferred sems is not preferred here See, you are, you have a gall bladder there. No? It will block the cystic duct and gall the bladder. It will produce cholecystitis. So it's better to put the multiple opening plastic stent in these patients. Okay, if he has not had a gall bladder, fine. Otherwise, if he gets infected with a gall bladder, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. Do cholecystostomy, you can't do anything, and even co doing cholecystectomy itself is very difficult in these patients because you'll have right. cholecystostomy difficult. Well, Well, yeah, so you can't do bleeding. Cholecystectomy is difficult. Cholecystostomy is difficult. Even with the boldest uh, surgeon, also will be little hesitant to do laparoscopic yes, cholecystectomy Because in a person with the HPVO. When he bleeds on the table, that's the yeah. Is the end of it. It bleeds massively, so the portal pressures are very. So I think you should put more multiple times MPS, multiple plastic cells, and exchange it over the period of time. So learn what are the surgical treatments we can do. So if the it's not reducing, then you should do a hepaticogenostomy. Hepaticogenostomy. Beyond hepaticogenostomy, the only way is you have to do a transplant. Okay. Suppose there are multiple sutures. The multiple sutures. The other thing will be hepaticogenostomy. No, is there do do you think do you do anything specific for the portal hypertension or only give proper and low? Shunt procedures. Yeah, this is another indication where they are they are doing shunt. shunt. Shunt, you can do a shunt provided. So, how do you image it? Actually, what you should image is this. What yeah. at least we do an MRI abdomen with MR porto venogram. So we do a porto venogram. You should. That's the first thing you should do in these patients, and see is there a shuntable vein or no shuntable vein. If there's a shuntable vein, if If sir, as sir said, if the patient has got a very early, uh, say, early portal biliopathy, whom they are symptomatic. What do we mean by symptomatic? They are getting itching and jaundice. Then you can you can try if there is a shuntable vein. You should do a shunt procedure, and occasionally with the shunt procedure, it may go away. Still, again, with twenty to thirty percent shunt procedure, it may not go away. Then you have no other option of then you can keep doing. Multiple plastic surgery exchanges. Okay, in this patient, I think now you can do multiple plastic exchanges because we already formed stones and all. Then later you should probably try and see whether later if you can do shunt procedure much early. Because eighty percent times they are asymptomatic, they may just show some scalloping of the bile duct in MRC. But if you have a, you can do a shunt that time and try to do. But generally they will come with a mild There's an itching. That's a time you can do shunt and see if you can decompensate. But a patient has gone to a stricture like this, multiple stones. I don't think they really respond to shunt procedure. In that time, you can exchange multiple plastic stents. And this, the problem with stents is sometimes in all these patients, they can be an ingrowth into the system, and it's very difficult to remove the the setting of an intracolidocal varices. So ingrowth of into the cells is a major problem in these patients. So you want to be very careful when you do this patient. Madam, sir, you want to say anything? There was a question whether one should do sphincterotomy or sphincteroplasty. I think we can do a careful sphincteroplasty. The stones are very big. There is no harm in doing a sphincteroplasty. But when you have a sphincteroplasty, when you are doing a sphincteroplasty, the most important thing is don't lose. The guide one. If you lose a guide wire, it starts bleeding. Then it's very difficult to access it. So never lose a guide wire when you're doing a sphincteroplasty in these patients. You can do a small sphincteroplasty sometimes. So generally, what you can do sometimes is when the bleeding, you can start NTG drip the bleeding to stop, or you may have to give them hot cream during the bleed. Occasionally, what are the most of the time the bleed stops, but you can just put up the stent, or you can put a Balloon and then keep it compressed. It will go. Bleed will go. 
Spectrotomy can be done carefully. Okay, it's a good case. I think we had a good discussion on this. How do we really proceed with this one? No? So again, I'm telling you, don't get into this clues. Okay, and uh, you you should, uh, Doctor Shiva, you should have broadened your differential diagnosis and say what it is. Okay. Sir. Now, none of us knew the case, but we knew only a stone. That's I think that's a way you practice and see what it is in a broader perspective. Yeah, it's a painful cholesterol. Put EHBO and put so many diagnoses, stricture and all. That's not the way. We, we, we need, you need to give a diagnosis based on this history. If you, you should minus stricture. How does an EHBO stricture present to you? They present with cholangitis. They have come with fever and chills. So it's not a stricture, actually. There's some mild narrowing and then there is a, there is, there is a stone which has blocked. So now you need to know the diameter of the CPD. After you completely clear the bile duct, remove your skin, then do an MRI with MR photogram and MRCP, see what it is. Okay. In olden days, we used to do what is known as spinophotominograph. Do you have any idea what it is? Okay. The spleen was punctured and I was injected into the splenic pulp and uh, the, the, the contrast would fill up the splenic collaterals from the hilum and then the splenic vein and gradually the portal vein and the uh, tributaries of the portal vein. This was called uh, splenopotovinogram. Nowadays no one does it, but uh, for historical sake you may know it because at least uh, in some cues etc you may be shown this or at least in some of the examiners who have done this earlier during their early career they may bring one picture. So at least they search the net and try to find out the spleen or photovenogram. One may find beautiful pictures of uh, portal cavernoma and because I would say the most beautiful pictures of portal cavernoma I have because seen is the spleen or photovenogram because it will show you the anatomical continuity of the venous system very well and uh, you can think properly as to where is the problem and what exactly is the problem. You can have a sort of 3D idea of uh, the, uh, the cavernoma. Okay, all other pictures will give you some sort of a cross section or other sort of imaging. This will give you a better picture, a to in total picture. So at least uh, go to Google and try to find out uh, a spino photo venogram. Okay, sir. Adima. Yeah, I'm just saying, yeah. I think, uh, I think the history is important and the uh, GIB should have come ahead and uh, have an unbiased approach to the presentation. You get saying some severe pain, you know, you want to make it a stone pain, make it a stone pain. Suddenly a pain, that, and a stone pain will never increase after food intake. You know? The way you describe you know, acute pain of the meal, all that. There's no the blunt injury was again a fallacious, you know, it was just diverting her attention. So I think you would think what first time you said that acute pain, sharp pain, and all it has to be a gallstone or a CBD stone. It can't be you can't harp only on a portal biliopathy presenting like this. And ultimately, I find there's not much of portal biliopathy in this. And you should also assess on the presence of the presence of the enzymes, everything together, and then do it. Madam, so. I think we should have a higher end imaging. No? Mm. We should have had an MR photogram with MRCP. We should have. Do it and then you go take him up for a For the patient, we need a shunt procedure for all you know, maybe and liver is MR photovenogram and see. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think the ideal investigation high end would have been an MRI with the MR photovenogram and MRCP. Yes. That would have made it complete. It was the best. That's what is recommended these days for this. Okay, sir. Good night. Okay, thank you. I think it was a good discussion. It was a good I discussion. Think. It's a good case. It's a very good case for discussion. If get for the exam, I think uh, it will go on like this. Okay. What is it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, painful yeah. obstructive jaundice. Uh, I, I, no, I have no have comments, to... LDK. LDK, I have no comments. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Uh, I think um, stone disease has to be number one because of the pain and obstructive yeah. jaundice. No. Okay, sir. Good night. Okay. Good night. Bye -bye. That was a nice discussion. Thank you. And Thank thanks you. all the thanks the presenter and the discussions. It was good a... discussion. Good case. Yeah. I think just have to fine tune all your. This if you keep on presenting and just think, 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 and go ahead with it. Go back to the investigations. So, okay. Sir.
tomorrow it is tomorrow I'm writing a, writing a full case sheet in all this patients and committing a diagnosis otherwise presentations are not coming up to the mark honestly in the exam okay, okay. thank Good you night. Night. see you again year. on happy new happy, year happy new year to all Ah, we should, we should. Yeah, madam, you won't take this. Madam is tired of the journey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can. Hyderabad, that. Mumbai. We were in Mumbai. No, very, very tired. Bye. Okay, have Thank a you, madam. Sleep. Okay, sir. So we'll meet on twenty seventh. Twenty seventh. Twenty seventh. We'll meet on twenty seventh, sir. Again. Yeah, next class, no. Yeah, next okay. class. There From our side, the next class is by Professor Vinayamar on eighteenth Tuesday. Okay. 18th. Okay then, bye. Good night. Bye, sir. Thank you. I am closing the session.